Hey guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about Bad Chiari Syndrome. So let's get started. So what is Bad Chiari Syndrome? Bad Chiari Syndrome is an uncommon condition caused by either a thrombotic or a non-thrombotic obstruction of the hepatic venous outflow. This condition is characterized by a classic triad of symptoms which includes hepatomegaly, ascites, and abdominal pain. So from this definition, we get that Bad Chiari syndrome occurs when we have an obstruction in the hepatic venous outflow. And this can either be a thrombotic cause or a non-thrombotic cause. So to explain this in an easier manner, let's do a quick recap of the liver anatomy. So if we take a closer look on this picture on my left, we see that the liver has two main venous systems, and that's the portal vein, which enters the liver, and then we have the right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and left hepatic vein, which are the essential components of the venous outflow or the drainage of the liver. So in Bad Chiari syndrome, essentially what we have is we have an obstruction which occurs in these outflow veins. So these veins, the right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and left hepatic vein, go on to join and drain into the inferior vena cava, which is here. So the obstruction can occur here, or here, or here. And in most cases, it is due to a thrombus which forms in these veins, but sometimes it could be due to compression of these veins from surrounding structures. So if, for example, we had a tumor here, in the liver, it would compress this vessel and also obstruct the venous outflow. But we'll get into a bit more detail as we go along. So coming back to our first slide, we see that we have these occlusions in the hepatic venous outflow and the patient will suffer hepatomegaly because of course if that blood is blocked, it has nowhere to go and it's going to completely saturate the venous system and without proper blood flow, the liver is going to start to swell. And that's why the hepatomegaly sets in. We're also going to have ascites because all that fluid now is now going to find a way to escape and it's going to start to build up in the abdomen. And then we're also going to have the onset of pain because now we have fluid and an enlarged liver, which is going to contribute to the pain. So these are the classic three symptoms that point us towards a Bad Chiari syndrome the hepatomegaly, the ascites, and the abdominal pain. So what are the causes of Bad Chiari syndrome? So as I mentioned earlier, most of the cases are caused by a thrombus, which occludes the vessels. So 75% of cases of Bad Chiari syndrome are actually thrombotic. And hepatic vein thrombuses usually occur in patients with polycythemia rubra vera, pregnant women, women who take oral contraceptives, patients with paracysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, patients with current infections that they may be suffering from, patients with autoimmune disorders or who take any sort of immunosuppressant drugs, and patients who have suffered a recent trauma. So all these points are actually pro-thrombotic features. So these are all cases or situations in which thrombi usually develop. And these could all lead to the onset of a Bad Chiari syndrome. So we also have non-thrombotic causes in 25% of cases of Bad Chiari syndrome. And this is when the hepatic venous outflow can be compressed by outside structures, so structures that surround the vessels, or by an intraluminal invasion. So any sort of tumor, cyst, or abscess in the liver can compress the vessel and thereby obstruct the hepatic venous outflow. We could also have any tumor, cysts, or abscesses in the gallbladder, because that's situated very close to the liver, in the duodenum, or any other structure that's closely situated to the liver, can compress these hepatic veins and can cause an outflow obstruction. Sometimes we can also have patients with parasites who have an intraluminal invasion of the hepatic veins, so the parasites actually enter into the vessel and therefore can cause a blockage in the flow of blood. So these are the non-thrombotic causes of Bad Chiari syndrome. So what are the signs and symptoms of Bad Chiari syndrome? Because Bad Chiari syndrome blocks the drainage system of the liver, impeding the blood flow back to the heart, without proper blood flow, the liver stops getting fresh oxygen it needs to function. 
This can severely damage the liver and may lead to liver failure. Signs and symptoms may include jaundice, ascites, hepatomegaly, nausea and vomiting, splenomegaly, ankle edema, stasis ulcerations, the prominence of collateral veins, esophageal varices, and unexplained weight loss. So in this picture, we see the hepatomegaly, which is the enlarged aspect of the liver. And here we see a patient who's suffering from collateral circulation, and you see the presence of these collateral veins. Because their blood has no way to escape to, it's going to cause an ascites, which is an enlarged abdomen with fluid inside. It's going to cause an enlarged liver, which is hepatomegaly. When the liver is enlarged, it stops functioning, and we have an increase in bilirubin, which leads to jaundice. We also have nausea and vomiting. Splenomegaly is also caused because the blood has nowhere to go and it'll backflow to the spleen, causing the spleen to enlarge. Uh, ankle edema will be caused because we have that blood pooling in the lower part of the body and the esophageal varices will also become prominent um, in the esophagus and may lead to hematemesis, which is the vomiting of blood, etc. So now let's talk about the diagnosis of Bad Chiari syndrome. A clinical suspicion of Bad Chiari syndrome in all patients with abdominal pain, ascites, or hepatomegaly should be established. So again, we talk about our classic triad in Bad Chiari syndrome, the abdominal pain, ascites, and hepatomegaly. So the first thing we can do is a lab test, and liver function tests should be completed. And usually in the majority of patients, we see abnormal results. So our liver enzymes such as ALT, AST, alkaline phosphatase, GGT, and bilirubin, all those levels will be increased because our liver is now enlarged, it's in a state of hepatomegaly, and it's sending out a distress signal. So we can also examine the ascitic fluid, which will provide us useful clues, including high protein concentrations. So if we have a protein concentration greater than two grams per deciliter, or a white blood cell count of less than 500 microliters, and a serum ascites albumin gradient, which is usually less than 1.1, then we can suspect a Bad Chiari syndrome. We can also do some imaging studies. Here we can use an abdominal ultrasound with a Doppler flow, which can show the obliteration of the hepatic veins, a thrombosis or stenosis, spider web in the vessels, large collateral vessels, or a hyperechoic cord replacing a normal vein. So we see the large amount of ascitic fluid and we also see this dark blue which means venous blood within a vessel that is not moving. So that tells us that a thrombus is actually situated there. Magnetic resonance angiography and a CT are useful if the ultrasound is not clear. And conventional angiography which means venography with pressure measurements and arteriography is necessary if therapeutic or surgical intervention is planned because that will give us a much better view on what's happening from an internal level. So this is a CT of Bad Chiari syndrome, and this is secondary to cancer. So we see all these little spots of cancer, which is actually liver metastasis. So all these different collections of cancer cells will go on to compress the hepatic venous outflow system. And here, with this arrow, we see the inferior vena cava, which is actually noted with a clot in it. So as we said earlier, the right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and left hepatic vein all drain into the inferior vena cava. So if we have a large clot in the inferior vena cava, we're going to have the onset of a Bad Chiari syndrome. Continuing with diagnosis methods, we can also do a liver biopsy. And the liver biopsy will usually show a high grade of venous congestion and a central lobular liver cell atrophy. It'll also show thrombi within the terminal hepatic venules. So now let's talk about the treatment of Bad Chiari syndrome. Treatment of patients with Bad Chiari syndrome should be aimed at aggressively correcting or alleviating the venous outflow obstruction. So the first therapeutic method could be to do systemic thrombolysis. And here we use anticoagulant therapy, which are blood thinning medications that are needed in some patients especially those with underlying hematological disorders. We can also use thrombolytic therapy, 
So the word thrombo means a thrombus and lytic means to cut or to slice. So thrombolytic therapy are clot busting drugs, which include medications such as streptokinase, urokinase, recombinant tissue type plasminogen activator or RTPA, etc. So the little note in the top right corner says, while medical therapy can be instituted for short-term and symptomatic benefit, medical therapy alone has been associated with a high two-year mortality rate, which is 80 to 85 percent. So usually these patients will need a more invasive form of treatment. So let's explore those further. So another form of local thrombolysis can be done through radiologic intervention and it can be done by an angioplasty with a stent placement, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunts, or a venous shunt surgery. So these are all a little more invasive and they involve the placement of a shunt or a new route for the blood to flow through. So in this way, we can alleviate the outflow obstruction. And these treatments actually prove to be a lot more successful in terms of long-term benefit to the patient. So continuing with treatments, of course, we mentioned that Bad Chiari syndrome causes a lot of other signs and symptoms in the body. So we also need to treat the viruses which occur in the esophagus, etc. So an upper GI endoscopy may show esophageal viruses in these patients, and these may be treated by banding or sclerotherapy. We can also use non-selective beta blockers, such as propranolol or nadelolol, which can also be administered for primary prophylaxis against the varicel bleeding. We also educate the patient to make some dietary changes and a low sodium diet is recommended for the control of the ascites and the edema. So that is the pooling of the fluid in the abdomen and at the lower ankles because they usually suffer a lot from ankle edema. Abdominal paracentesis must also be done and this is a procedure where we insert a needle or a catheter into the peritoneal cavity to obtain the ascitic fluid for diagnostic and for therapeutic purposes. So patients with Bad Chiari syndrome who suffer from ascites will need to drain that excess fluid accumulation in the abdomen and this is done by a process of abdominal paracentesis. And finally, a liver transplantation. This should be offered to patients with severe cirrhosis and when decompensation is present. So in patients with severe liver disease and end-stage liver failure, the only option we have there is a liver transplantation. And that brings us to the end of this presentation on Bad Chiari Syndrome. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you found the presentation very interesting and informative. If you would like to download a copy of the presentation, please make sure to click the link in the description. Please like, comment, subscribe and share and please turn on your bell notifications so you can be notified every time we have a new upload. Take care and bye for now.